So welcome to the Java user group Darmstadt. Tonight uh, we got a um, night hacking team uh, here. <laughs> um, and our main speaker is uh, David Blevins. Uh, you may introduce yourself. I will pass the mic to you. So we I have, uh, well, maybe it doesn't work. Do I need both? Yeah, you don't. Okay, uh, yeah, so David Blevins, um, I've been participating in Java EE for a really long time. Um, my first project that I worked on was OpenEJB in 1999. That was an open source project that's still around. Uh, in fact, I started working on that project the same month that my wife and I were married, so I guess I've been married to both ever since, so kind of romantic in that sense. Uh, I started participating in the specifications in EJB 3.0. It was part of the people who put annotations uh, into that spec. Um, and then I started participating in EE6 and in EE7 and now EE8. And I'm in a bunch of other JSRs that I have, more JSRs than I have time for. But uh, there's some really cool stuff that's there. And I kind of like to present the things that aren't getting talked about a lot. So we're going to see a lot of crazy edge stuff. Um, and uh, hopefully that will be fun. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've, I've got uh, two different uh, topics. So this is sort of like a, a blend of a couple different talks that I gave at Java 1. I, I'm going to try and take my favorite parts of the two of them and make one talk out of it. So it's going to shift gears like halfway through. Uh, so the first part is really about extensibility. And so there is actually a, a hidden feature inside CDI. Who's heard of CDI? Good, good. This would be a very big talk. To, uh, great. So you're at the right spot. Uh, so in CDI, there's actually the ability to add your own bean types. People don't know this. It's very strange. There, these things are called scopes in CDI, and you can add your own custom scope. And it's a feature that's there. It's been there from the beginning since CDI 1.0. But exactly how to do it has been kind of an unused and untrodden territory. So if you want to go that way, you'll, you'll be looking around for blog posts, and you won't find anything useful. And uh, so I'm going to show you some, some actual simple working scopes that you can download and try yourself, and some base classes for making your own scopes. Um, the second one we're going to do is just sort of like fun uh, opportunities for us to maybe change the way EE works because of Java 8. So every time a new major language comes around, major language change comes around, like say EE5 when it, or Java 5 when it added annotations, that really had an impact on the way EE was done. Before that, it was like all XML. And in fact, many of you maybe didn't even use Java EE before annotations were, were involved in Java EE, because before then it was really difficult to use. Maybe you were forced to use it. Uh, now we have functions and we have lambdas, and we have method references, and these have the opportunity to have some pretty big impact on, uh, on just Java E in general. Uh, so first, so the extendable portion. So the background of this is at a high level, we are taking EJB and moving the best parts onto CDI. And the reason we're doing this is because one, EJB has a lot of legacy, things like CMP that we don't need anymore. Uh, but also, CDI really was born out of EJB and has almost identical functionality. Where they differ is the life cycles of EJB are rather fixed, and the life cycles of CDI are extensible. These are the scopes. Um, so here is how, if you, in order to understand this portion of this talk, you got to memorize this picture and understand every portion of it. So effectively, what we have, and by the way, who, who knows what a proxy is? Good, good, <laughs> just making sure. So effectively, a proxy is a fake version of the bean. So that is what's actually injected. When you, ref when you use at inject or use at EJB and get an EJB injected into your class, you're actually talking to a fake version of the bean. And what the container does is that when you invoke a method on it, it's going to go down through this path here, and it's going to do what's called resolution. It's going to first find the target instance that it needs to invoke. 
So for a stateful session bean, it's going to look at a map and find the one instance that matches up with that proxy. For a stateless session bean, it's going to go to a pool, check an instance out of the pool, and, uh, and for singleton, there's just one. And so it will lazily instantiate that singleton if it's not been already created. And if it has been created, it will just simply use it. Those are the basic life cycles of EJB. And EJB has several qualities of service that it will offer. So effectively, they're like interceptors that are built into the container. And they allow for transaction management to happen or security to be enforced. Um, there's interceptors and decorators, which allow you to do your own types of logic around method invocations. So it's around advice. And CDI has the same thing. So CDI uh, has interceptors. CDI actually added decorators. Decorators also work in EJB. There's a little known fact that EJB is basically all of CDI plus its own things. So CDI is a effectively a subset in some regards of EJB because at the very early, early days of CDI, in the EJB specification, we made the choice that we were going to support 100% of what CDI had to offer. That we weren't going to like, you know, make people have to pick, right? So basically, from day one, CDI became an implementation requirement for all, all EJB containers had to fully support every CDI feature on an EJB. So, so EJBs actually include all of the CDI functionality. So that's why on the one side, we see far more things in here. Maybe Stephen can cut off the uh, little thing there. He's supposed to remind me to let him know and to shut the little picture off. There we go. <laughs> so now, now I can really quiz you because I, now you can see the whole thing. So effectively, there at the bottom is the real instance. At the top is the proxy. And this is where the magic happens on every invocation. We, do, we go down this path, right? And so that real instance in the CDI world is held in a scope. So EJB has basically those three fixed type of beans. And this, the container finds them in, in three very fixed ways. And in CDI, this bean resolution is actually delegated to something called a scope. There's an, imp there's an actual interface that's implemented. And it basically says, you know, here's a context. Uh, go ahead and create that instance or give me the existing one if it's there. And it's a very simple contract. Although it's shrouded by mystery, but we're going to hopefully try and peel that back. Um, so part of the alignment strategy that I mentioned is many of you know it's a very small change in EJB uh, in Java EE7 we added at transactional which is identical to at transaction attribute. So this uh, this annotation can be used on CDI beans and it basically allows them to also start transactions the way EJBs have been able to start transactions. And this is an example of how we're effectively trying to move all the good parts of EJB onto CDI. Um, and the primary motivation for you choosing CDI over EJB is, like I say, it's going to be what all the new things are developed on. All the specifications are aligning on top of CDI. MVC, which is a new specification coming out in EE8, is model view controller, sort of a uh, new client type of a you know spring MVC kind of inspired thing. All CDI based. JAXRS is going to be supporting CDI. JSF made a choice to support CDI very early on. So basically, in EE7, JSF started to really tie itself to CDI. So there's lots of motivations there. So here's how those life cycles that are in EJB line up to the existing scopes in CDI. Effectively, application scoped, and you can put the thing back. Application scoped is effectively singleton. It doesn't support locking like singletons do, but it's effectively the same kind of contract. There's one of them going that's going to exist in the system. Session scoped is effectively like stateful. Um, and there's really no equivalent for stateless beans. Stateless beans are, are notoriously misnamed. 
They're actually pooled beans. And uh, just because way back in the e early days, EJB won, destroying instances repeatedly was very expensive. The garbage collector couldn't keep up. So they made the choice, well, we're going to pool these instances, and that will solve this. But then eventually the garbage collector could do that quite easily, and there was no need to keep a pool of instances. And so that legacy is still there under the previous name, stateless. But in fact, they're really pooled beans. Um, so beware. If you're using them now, who's using stateless beans? Okay. All right. So check your pool settings on your container because you might have a bottleneck that you don't even know because you, you won't discover it during testing. It'll be during performance. You might see things a little bit constrained. The CPU is not getting fully leveraged. You might be hitting the limitation of your, of your stateless bean pool. Okay. So we've got this one little project. You might want to snap a picture of this because this is where all the code is going to live. I'll show you this URL again. Uh, in case you're not motivated to take a picture now. But, uh, all right, let's. So, as we mentioned, the place where the real instance lives is in the scope, and that's the thing that lives behind the proxy, right? And it's possible for you to decide that you're going to have effectively, eff at, at the low level, a scope is effectively a hash map. The contract is effectively this. You have to implement something that basically allows you to get an instance. And if it's not there, you have to create it. In Java 8, this is ex so, so simple because hash maps have compute if absent. And so all our scope implementation is is a concurrent hash map that holds an instance in reference to a context. Forget what context is. It's not necessarily important. What you really got to focus on, though, is basically we're passing in a function. This is a, this is a supplier. And what it's going to do is going to go ahead and create that instance if it doesn't already exist in the hash map. So then we just have another concept where we have to destroy all the instances in the hash map. So session scoped is effectively nothing more than taking care of the plumbing of taking things in and out of the HTTP session map. And we're doing the same thing here, except now this map isn't necessarily tied to an HTTP session. It's sort of this generic concept that has no real meaning or context. This is a base class. And to actually make this do something interesting, we'll show a simple example of a scope. So there's the test. OK. Here we have a simple bean. It's a REST, REST bean, REST service, JAX-RS. And we have three paths on it, red, green, and blue. We have injected one bean called count. And what, where is count going to come from? Our scope. How does the scope know which bean to find? Well, that's, that's the magic. So, so what we have under the covers is we have a CDI extension. And this is how you install a new scope. You add the annotation that's effectively like at session scoped, at request scoped, so on. You make up your own annotation. I've made my own annotation. I've called it method scoped. And it's right here in this package, in this project. That's not a built-in built -in one. I have an interceptor, which I add into the system. And then I actually register the implementation of the scope via this call. 
So you add the context, and that, that effectively gives the, the plumbing that is the scope into the system. And you're going you're to notice I'm using the same class, this generic class that implements context. And as you can see, here's the simplicity that it is. This is effectively get and compute if absent. And this is get. And if it's not there, don't make it. Just let me know if you have it. And, uh, and is active. This is very much a simplified hash map interface, which is all you really have to implement in order to add your own scope. So I have a, a generic implementation of it, which is very reusable in pretty much any context. So you actually don't have to implement the plumbing if you don't want to. So I have this in a generic abstract uh, library called Microscope. This whole, all these scopes exist in a project that we call Microscoped, because it's a fun name to call it. Um, and so this is Microscoped Core, and does nothing but have these two classes, scope context and scope. So I've registered my scope implementation, and then I have to do only one piece of work. I've got to let the container know when it started and when it stopped. Effectively, I have an interceptor that has an around invoke method. And at the beginning, I activate my scope, and that effectively associates it, associates it with a thread local, so that when the CDI container says, give me an instance, it knows how to respond. And when the method is finished, I remove the thread local effectively, so now that scope is no longer in effect. I am keying my scope instance based upon the method instance. So in my scope context, which is effectively a map of maps, because scope is a map, I have several maps, one for each method that might be possibly invoked through this interceptor. So what we end up with is count is annotated with method scoped. We have color service with what appears to be just one reference, we're actually going to wind up with three instances of count. One for the red method, one for the green method, one for the blue method. So if I go ahead and, and run this, It went ahead and worked. So look, look at the assertions. It asserts that we have a little uh, client here. And it, this assert request will do a web request to that URI. And then it grabs another thing, and it, and it asks, what was, the, what was the value returned? So if you look at our color service, all it does is do an add and return that number. That's all it's doing. And all count does is just simply have an atomic integer and increment by one. So this code is ex ex very, very simple. But because count is method scoped, we have three methods. Each method is going to get its own counter. You would normally have to do this with a hash map. You would put your hash map right here. You would say private, you know, method, not method, right, I guess, like that. And you would go count. And then effectively, you would have to go get. Yeah, uh, yeah. There you go. You would basically do that. Got to import. And you would get a count, and that would be the one you would use. That would effectively achieve the same thing. But 
the map and tracking is now handled contractually behind the concept of scope, which you activate and, and basically shut off at will. And so this code becomes significantly simpler. And you don't need to have this type of map anymore. Very simple. That's all that's going on under the covers. And so to give some ideas on where you might use this kind of thing, I've created some, some other examples of scope. So here's a, here's a fun one that actually has kind of practical usage, is domain scope. So again, we have a new annotation, and I'm using the same kind of paradigm so that it stays familiar, and only small changes will be between each example. So here we have a new annotation that we make up. It's called domain scope. And it's annotated normal scope, just like our other one. It's all the same boilerplate, but the only difference is the name, OK? We annotate it on the same kind of count class, but now this count class is not scoped by the method, scoped by the domain. And I have a service that has simply one method, and it's basically getting the count, and it returns it. Then I have a test, and in this test, basically what I'm doing is I am effectively, uh, I've aliased my computer in my Etsy host file. Or I'll just use less. So I've got orange, red, and right? So I have, I have two aliases for my, for my computer. So I can, I can send requests to uh, my computer, not just with localhost, but I can call my computer orange, and it will respond. And I can call my computer red, and it will respond. So I effectively am doing you know, two virtual domains, right? So I have my one website responding to two different identities. And I want to give different data to the user based upon what identity they're asking me about. So this is a kind of a virtual, virtual hosting scenario where you might have one website responding as, as, you know, one server responding as two different websites. So what we're doing here is, as you can see, this is the magic right here. We're making a URI. And right there, we're passing in the domain. So we wind up with you know, HTTP colon slash slash red, then the, the rest of the path. HTTP colon slash slash orange, then the rest of the path. So now we're going to do a cert domain, and effectively it's the same thing. We're going to make a request. That service is going to return a number. And we only have one method in that service, but we're going to notice that the domains increment independently because of our scope. So I'll run this. So how did we make this magic work? Again, we have a CDI extension to install our scope. So we say, here's the scope name. We say, this scope annotation is supplied by that context class. We haven't actually added any real code. It's a pretty looking, looking pretty boilerplate. But we have a filter. Instead of an interceptor this time, now we have a servlet filter that grabs the scope class. This, this is going to get us an instance of scope context. And what we do is we take and we grab the domain from the servlet request. This is going to give us red or orange. 
So now we effectively say, find the scope instance that belongs to red or create it if it isn't there, and now give it to me effectively and make and attach it to the thread local so that when someone goes to make an invocation on count, you want to look in the hash map that is associated with red. And then we continue our request, and in the end, we exit. We disassociate red from the thread local. So the next request that comes in could be for orange, and we'll then get orange, and we'll attach it to the thread local, do the request, unattach it from the thread local, and abracadabra, in our service class, we can change and be, you know, this is like schizophrenia here. This, this, this thing doesn't even know what, what, what website it is. It could be red or it could be orange. It just says, doesn't matter what it is, there's going to be something, some data associated with that, with that virtual domain, and I want to act on it. You could do interesting things, such as populate red with a different set of objects, populate orange with a different set of objects, and then easily toggle between your website domain uh, uh, logic transparently. And in fact, that is one of the advantages of CDI and dependency injection, is that you are not looking up your logic from a hash map and doing all this work based upon if it's the red website or the orange website. The advantages of dependency injection is that you're abstracting that stuff out so you can have many websites that follow basic logic and the specific details of the implementation classes are somewhere else. So you could actually have a whole set of red red beans and a whole set of orange beans, but some some fundamental logic which does basic service requests and you know has all that polymorphed behind. It doesn't have to worry about it. So it's a it's an advantage of of what you could possibly do. Here's another one. This one is effectively a header scoped bean. So again, count. Now we've annotated with header scoped. We have a simple service. Again, has count. But now count is going to be scoped at an incoming HTTP header. We make, now this does assert domain, should say. I'm going to refactor this live here. Assert header. There we go. Yay, IntelliJ. By the way, there's a license for IntelliJ that I'm supposed to be giving away. So since I happened to plug it right there, <laughs> it just reminded me. So uh, wh wh whoever looks the most interested in this presentation, I guess, will get it. <laughs> anyway, so. What we're doing in this one is is we're gonna we're gonna pass in uh, an HTTP header called version, right? And this is kind of like a discussion you may have in your in your in your uh, companies a lot, which is oh we have a REST API and we, we might we, we might want to change it someday. And do we put a version on there? Do we put it in the path? Do we put it in the header? Or do we not use version at all? Like this is one of those things that you'll probably have lots of meetings over. And so. <laughs> so here we go. Here's an example of how you might tackle that, right? So we have a header that's called version, and here we're gonna we're gonna pass in 1.0 or 1.1, and uh, then we just simply you know invoke uh, the bean through a REST, and of course, just as before, this count is going to be different based upon the incoming HTTP header. And so we'll go ahead and run it. OK. All right, so that worked. So we effectively have two requests for the 1.0 header. We can see that's incrementing. Then we go ahead and invoke. The one one header, we can see that increments independently. Then we go back and we implement, we increment the one oh header again, and we we finally implement the one. Now again, I'm showing just counts, but the whole 
argument that you might have in your meeting rooms about versioning is that you have logic that will be slightly different for one version and slightly different for another version. And how do you handle that without copying and pasting all your code? Uh, abstractions and polymorphing is how you handle that without copying and pasting all your code. So if you can abstract out the things that are different, put them behind an interface, then make that implementation injected, and then swap out the implementation first based upon the header, that's, you're done. I mean, it's a lot of magic, but it will be ultimately tight code. It'll be pretty clean code in the end. So how did we make that one work again? Same old extension, installing the scope in the same old way. Uh, this one, we have another servlet filter. We effectively have this method called get key, which we can configure what header we want to be tracking the scope on. So here we've configured it uh, to be uh, for version. And that's been done. here. So we have effectively another extension that's installed that will <laughs> grab our, our, you know, via CDI, you can observe everything as it's being added. And there are several lifecycle phases that have several, gives you several opportunities to mess with stuff. And so our scope implementation was added early. And our scope implementation has a simple little API, which is a basic CDI bean that says, you know, let me know what header you want me to track on. OK? So that's a bean, plain old CDI bean. It's installed by the scope implementation. In my application, I grab that sucker, and I say, track on version. And if version's not there in the header, they didn't pass me any version header, I want you to set the default value to 1. And then I can go ahead and be blissfully ignorant of the rest. And now it all works. My servlet filter, that's in the scope implementation, is going to effectively grab, this will be version. And then I go ahead and I see, excuse me, this will be version. This will get me the actual header value of this request. And if there is no header value in this request, I get the default value, which is 1. And then it's the same old stuff. Grab the scope implementation. Tell it to enter the context, do the, do, the, do the request, and then restore everything when it's done, and boom. It's the same thing. So we've effectively seen you know, several examples of, here's, here's one last one, and then we'll move on to functional stuff. Uh, who uses EJB timers at schedule? OK. One person in the room. They're really cool. I'm going to sell you on them before, before we leave this room. Who uses cron? OK. Jeez, only three people using cron. That's strange. Who uses Windows? <laughs> OK. So in EJB, there is an API. Quartz. I should have signed Quartz. Who uses Quartz? OK, we got more hands on that one. Quartz is basically built in now. So we added an API that is effectively a wrapper and uh, on a very Quartz-like thing. And uh, so this is effectively an annotation version of Quartz. You can give, you can give a schedule and say, invoke this method uh, at this rate, right? And uh, and here's another one that invokes it at this rate. And you can also programmatically schedule timers. So these are effectively all the same. So we actually, this application effectively has four timers firing all at the same time against this one instance. So again, if we want to track some work that we're doing over a period of time and associate that with the timer, we again make uh, a scope. So what, what might you use this for? Maybe you, s you notice there's a system failure, and you schedule a timer to watch that thing on an aggressive schedule every minute. 
Until it resolves, you're going to keep that timer going. And you might do this on a few different things. So you actually might want to track some state associated with, with that checking. So you're going to fire off several timers, one to check maybe individual servers. And when they come back, they're back. You can cancel that timer, and it's done. So how would you actually track state associated with the, those units of work when you have one instance, one class, that's going to service all of those timers? Well, you're either going to store a hash map or, well, you know the answer, scope. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna still use a hash map, but you're going to use a really fancy hash map, the, the kind of hash map that will get you a raise. <laughs> so all we need to do for that is... Again, we register our scope. This time, we're adding an interceptor. We're not going to use a servlet filter. We're going to use an interceptor. And here we have a filter. There is the actual ability to intercept timeout methods, timers, in, in EJB. There's just like there's an around invoke, there's actually an around timeout. And so what we do is we grab our scope implementation, We take and grab the timer from the invocation context. And we go ahead and get, the effectively, there's an info, which, which, which is going to be the method or a con a basically the, whatever data was passed in that was to create the timer. So in most situations, it will be a method. Where we used it like this, it's actually going to pass in blue the method blue, where we used it like this, it's actually going to pass in the string green. Either way, we're, we're capable of handling it. We're able to take and turn the timer instance into a key to, a, to the scope context. So this says, find me the scope implementation, or the scope instance associated with blue, red, green or orange, enable it, associate it with the thread local, call proceed, call exit, and that's it. So we have those four timers that are all going to be firing every second of every minute of every hour. And if we run this test, we should be able to see that they all happened. And this is going to, this is basically going to pause for seven seconds and then continue. And uh, yep, we were able to track data differently based upon each individual firing timer, which is, which is fairly interesting. Um, so, scopes. If you're thinking about storing stuff in a hash map, go ahead and do it, but abstract that so you don't have to have all this lookup, cast, method invocation, and dealing with null, and if it's null, add it to the ma hash map. That's like really bothersome code to be continuously working on. Always be going, oh, oh find it in a hash map. Oh, it's null. So then I'll lazily instantiate it. I'll put it in the hash map, and then now I can go on with my business logic. And your business log logic is going to look very messy if you're continuously doing that. Um, the the, the high-level take is that you know, whenever there's like a new bean type added to like EJB, we always get super excited. Singletons in EJB3, that's awesome, EJB3.1. We, we all rejoiced because we have singletons now. You could have added that yourself with CDI just use your own scope invitation. You, don't ha you, know, you, you can totally do these types of things yourself. You, as the implementer of the scope, it's your responsibility to resolve the instance. Wherever you want to put it, it's up to you. You could store that thing serialized on disk if you'd like. You could fetch it from across the network. You could do whatever you want. Your job as a scope implementation is to find the instance, which means you're the one controlling the lifecycle. So you can add your own bean type basically anytime you want. And that is the reality. So in fact, when a new bean type is added, like transaction scoped, and people rejoice, it's like, well, you could have done it already. You could just find the transaction manager, put your instance in the registry, take it out of the registry, and wrap that behind a scope implementation, 
install it in the same way you've been seeing all these installed, and you basically can add your own bead types at will right now. And it's the one of the biggest forms of extensibility that's built into EE. And we all walk over it every day, never really look down to see there's like a thousand dollar bill on the ground. And it, and it's it's effectively true, you know. Um, yeah, it's. I, I encourage you to take a look at this aspect. It's very overlooked. It's very misunderstood. Um, when when I tried to add my own scopes, I ran into several problems, and uh, I was basically picking through the Open WebBeans source code. I even found a a in a test case that had the logic to do it, but the test case actually didn't work. <laughs> It, it appeared to pass, but it wasn't actually passing accurately. So remember how we said that we, we get a proxy in, injected into our bean? The instance on the other side of that proxy is not created until you invoke a method on the proxy. That's what triggers the resolution, right? And so the test case actually just in, injected the instance, the proxy, tested that the proxy was not null, and said test pass. So the scope was never invoked. And so it was like that shy of being useful to me. And I was trying to get all this stuff to go like basically the night before my talk because I tend to do that. And uh, so I'm on, the f I'm on like IRC with like Mark Struberg, who is one of the main Open Web Beans contributor going, dude, why is this not working? Help me out. Yeah. So I, s I've, I sifted through all the stuff that would actually require you to get, be needed to get scopes to work. And I made this generic project. So if any of this interests you, you must go straight there, or you will face all the, all the horrible things that I encountered. Here's the list. So if you're forgetting to put Beans XML in your app and you're on an EE6 server, no CDI for you. That's a requirement for CDI to be enabled in an EE6 server. In EE7, it's automatically enabled, but not in EE6. You must have a Beans XML. Other one is you have to have at typed on there. Effectively, uh, if you have beans that are injectable uh, and you want to have a producer for them as well, uh, you, have to, you have to disable it being injectable via its constructor. You can't have a bean, because all beans in CDI are, are automatically added. So if you have a bean and it's like, say, count, for example, and you want to have a producer for count, you have to disable one or the other of them because you can't have two things that can create count because then CDI will complain that that's an ambiguous resolution problem. doesn't know which one to invoke. So you effectively have to strip off the types of the one of the bare class. You can do this with typed. If you're familiar with EJB, this is effectively the same as at local. At local allows you to specify the interfaces that the bean has and are visible and can be referenced can be used to reference the bean. So add typed is effectively saying to the CDI world, I want you to make this bean visible to the world of CDI as these types. And so when you, when you say add typed and you strip all the types off, you're basically saying do not instantiate this bean directly using the bean's constructor. Use the producer instead or use some other mechanism. So we put at typed on all of these beans, and it's a detail that I walked over. Uh, where, well, I'll skip it, but let's go back. Wrong presentation. The other one is, you might have noticed there was a couple booleans in my scope editions all the time. It was add scope, true, true. Add scope, true, true. Add scope, true, true. In CDI, you have to tell whether or not you want it to be what's called dependent scoped or normal scoped. The names are deceptive. The names do not match what they actually do. Normal scoped in CDI me world means I want this to be proxied, and dependent scoped means when it's referenced, I want you to create the instance and inject it, and you effectively get a a direct in re reference to the bean that's not proxied. So the name normal actually means proxied, and dependent means not proxied. 
And you tell the, the CDI container this with a Boolean, and that's a very small detail that's so easy to get wrong that will lead you down two completely different paths. All the proxy magic that I've been talking about will not happen if you go add sculpt false. <laughs> so one big mistake that can happen with the simple Boolean flip. So be aware of that one. OK. So any, any questions on scopes before I move on to functions? You know I have a thing to give away, right? OK. Uh, let me, there's the, there's the project if you want it. It's microscoped, basically. Uh, that's a little open source project that we have that we put all, all the stuff that we, that we kind of hack up for demos and, and little use for libraries and utilities. Um, we, we chuck them up there. Basically, if you just go to tommytribe.io, you'll find it. Okay. So, this is the part that's, uh, dare I say, more technical <laughs> than what we just covered. Uh, who, who, who's had a chance to, 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 to do anything with Java 8? Great, great, great. Okay. I, I, I feel for you guys who haven't. Uh, I, 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 you know, this is like the, the cruel reality is that app servers are always kind of like a version, a OS, uh, you know, like a Java version behind, you know, because like, and, and that really impedes your ability to dig into the new language features and see how, how might you change the APIs using these new features. So I effectively, I wanted to just, because I don't get a chance to use Java 8 myself when I'm right, when we're working on the app server, because it has to be basically to the lowest spec demanded uh, version. So in EE6, it's Java 6, right? That's really long in the tooth. And for EE7, it's Java 7, and, and the minimum version is, is EE8. So, you know, I, you know, basically, I won't get the joy of doing a lot of, uh, of Java 8 stuff until we're implementing EE8. But then that's like a catch-22. How do we get cool language features into Java EE8 if we're not allowed to play with Java 8 now, right? So I, I kind of wanted to just explore what we might do uh, to change the APIs if we were to take advantage of Java 8 features like functions, method references, lambdas, that kind of thing. So, um, I, have a, I, have a, I have another project that I've hacked up. And uh, I'm going to see if we can get through this without making people's brains bleed out their ears. Um, so he, here's, a, here's a simple one. This is the same schedule API that we saw before. We have uh, effectively three methods on here. This is a schedule thing, and this is like basically like cron. And since uh, cron sounds like corn, I decided to make a, th a farmer themed bean. So this is where Farmer Brown does all his corn jobs. That's a joke. So here he plants the corn in the spring. And then Farmer Brown harvests the corn in the fall. And if you've ever heard any jokes about farmers, you know they have to check on their daughters like every second of every minute of every hour of every day. So that's what Farmer Brown does all the time is he plants the corn, he harvests the corn. And we can test this with a simple embedded container test, cla test class. We, we get our Farmer Brown being injected. We wait five seconds, and then we see that, yes, in fact, he did check on his daughters at least four times. And there we go. So that worked. Now this is with annotations. And I think I sort of described that I think a fundamental thing that we don't do well in EE is programmatic APIs. We're really awesome at annotating things and going, 
that's logic. But that's declarative. It means you can't change your mind at runtime. You've made your choice at compile time, and that's it. And it's fine, and it's slick. I mean, you can't deny that this is a small amount of code. But if you wanted to do these things dynamically, you're looking at a slightly different s uh, scenario. There is a, a programmatic API for adding a timer. Um, it basically looks like this. Here's a simplified version of it. You get a timer service injected. And then you schedule a timer to execute every second of every minute of every hour of every day. And we go ahead and have at timeout on this method. And then we can go ahead and check on the daughters. But that's not exactly what we were doing in our previous version. We had three timers. This one just has one. This is what you normally see in examples on the internet. And it's ignoring one very uncomfortable fact. You can only have at one timeout on a bean. So how do you have three methods that have to be invoked with only one at timeout? This is one of those little details that we don't really think about at the spec level because we don't really spend a lot of time writing real world applications ourselves. We, we just make APIs and you go ahead and deal with the implications of our choices. So. You have to get very clever if you want to have three methods. Here's how clever you have to be. First, timer config is what actually is, is state. This instance, this class, this is actually passed into your timeout method. And it, you can get that timer config data when you call get info. So effectively, get info gives you a serializable object. And if you look at the constructor of timer config, it takes a serializable object. So you basically, you get, you get the opportunity to pass in a serializable object, and that's the only context you get to figure out what method to invoke. So the standard way that you would probably have to do this in a Java EE, or Java uh, 7 and below world, is you'd have to pass in a string, perhaps. And we pass in a different string for each of the timers. And then we've got an if block. If the string is this one, invoke that method. If the string is that one, invoke that method. If the string is this one, invoke that method. That's pretty tedious. Like, we, you know, it'll work. I mean, like, if we run this class, it's going to absolutely work. But it's very error prone. In Java 8, you can actually pass methods. So really, what I would want to do is instead of passing in a string and then use the string to find the method, I want to just pass in the method. That would be the shorter path. So here's a, here's a way you can do. And this will actually work now. This is a, this is a, a, a shortcut. This fun this 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 is a pun functions. It it works uh, in in Java eight on EE six or EE seven. Here's what we're gonna do. The little known fact that you can cat this is a method reference for people who aren't used to seeing them. Basically, this says pass this method as a serializable and runnable object into the constructor of timer config. Th people are definitely used to seeing this, but it's a little known fact in, e in Java 8, they actually added multicast. You can cast an object to two interfaces that have nothing to do with each other. We're getting a little small talky at this point, but it works. So. I am effectively taking this method, plant the corn, and I am casting it to a runnable that is also serializable. I am passing it into the timer config as a serializable object. Then, in my timeout method, where I would normally have a big if block, if this, then that method, if this, then that method, 
I take the serializable data and I cast it to runnable and then I invoke the runnable and now effectively I have a kind of a little timer bus, if you will. And now I can have and schedule many different types of work for many different methods programmatically just like I was doing in the annotation version. So using Java 8 functionality, I am actually allowed to do what the this, this same thing I could do with annotations in Java 7 and EE6 and EE7. So already we're seeing this is, this is a cool thing, but I, st I personally think this syntax is still a little bit much to chew on because our other version with annotations was was so small. I mean, look, I could, it can fit it all on one little page here. But then when I want to do the workaround, I mean, I'm I'm really looking at a lot of code. I mean, it's not like horrible, but I'm I'm just really picky with code size. I don't like I don't like the same boilerplate. So here's a potential opportunity that we have that we could do in EE8 to actually make this better. I did not want another window. Fat fingered that one. Okay. What we do is effectively we add a new method. What we could do is this is a, this is timer service. This is the standard interface. We add another method to it, and this method instead of taking a timer config, takes a timeout function. And then we can pass instead of passing the method reference as a serializable runnable into the timer config, we simply pass the function directly to the timer service when we say schedule this. So that allows us to have a significantly smaller syntax than we had before because we don't have to do all this weird heavy, heavy casting, creating a new timer config, casting the method reference to a serializable runnable, which is a lot of, seems small, but when you add it up, it really does become a lot. And now we've actually been able to do all of that, or would be, if this existed in EE8. We can still get it, because EE8's go ongoing. We're effectively adding all those method references directly when we schedule the timer. And now we have something that is programmatic, annotation-free, logic decided at runtime, and it is basically the same size as the annotation version. And then that would be really awesome if we could do that. Who would use this functionality? All right. I mean, you know I got this, right? <laughs> OK. So dare I say that's one of the simpler examples. Um, let's see how much we can stretch. I'm going to give you another one that you can use now, just because it's always good to walk out of a room with usable things mixed in with cool stuff that you can do in the future, hopefully. So uh, here's another thing that is currently functional. This is a simple data access object. We grab an entity manager, and we do some persistence on movie objects. We got a movie entity. Nope, don't care about Facebook right now. OK, so we have a simple movie entity, some, some basic data on it. And we have restrictions. Uh, only employees and managers can add a movie. Only a manager can delete a movie. And anybody can list movies. Simple roles allowed. This type of stuff is notoriously hard to test because you historically have no portable way to kind of log in and then add users in advance of testing. And so this actually makes it really a big deterrent to using the built-in container managed security that's right there in EE because testing this stuff is notoriously difficult. Here's a little technique that we have been advocating in the OpenAGB project for, for quite a long time. And it's much, much better in 
now that Java 8 is with us. The technique that we have ha always told people about is, why don't you make a bean that has run as manager and another bean that has run as employee, and you pass a callable into that bean. That bean will then invoke that method in the context of a basically an employee or in the context of a manager. This is effectively pseudo. You know, you're saying, go down a level as this user, run this script. So you're saying, go down as manager, run this callable. And then so all we wanted, all we need to do, if we want to test being what we can do as an employee, we make a new callable, we pass it into the employee bean, and then we execute all this code. And it works, it's totally fine, but we have a lot of inner classes, and that's sort of a pain in the butt. So the first thing when, when like, you know, Java 8 came out, I was like, oh, we don't need inner classes anymore. We can have lambdas. So instead of the inner class, we do this basically the same thing. We have a manager bean and an employee bean. And the same old run as, same old run as. Except now, instead of an inner class, we've got a lambda. This is what a lambda looks like for those of you who have not had the chance to use Java 8. It effectively is the same thing as the inner class, but the new portion of it, the new callable, you don't need that anymore. It's implied because run takes callable and callable has one method. So that's the, that's the critical thing you have to understand in order, in order to get this new magic that is Java 8. So it all is boiling down to the fact that the compiler and the VM can guess what interface that that one method should be wrapped as. So this thing effectively creates in bytecode what is something which is like a static inner class, a static method. And then kind of dynamically, it gets effectively wrapped as a callable instance. And the implementation call delegates to effectively this lambda. And, and that's how it works. If, I, if callable had two methods to implement, this would, this would not compile anymore. Because then the VM wouldn't be able to do its magic of lining up this, this magic method with this other method. And so basically, the, the fundamental rules of method references and lambdas are, if the method signature of the method that you're passing, you're, you want to cast as a callable, matches that one method signature of the interface, if those two method signatures match, then it's legal. If they don't match because this one accepts Boolean and this one accepts nothing, it does not work. So it's a little bit of magic. Now, that's how it looks with lambdas. Here's how it would look with, ref with the method references. Again, our same two beans, manager and employee. But now when we want to test as manager, we say run, and we pass in assert allowed, and come on, go back, and that gets cast to a callable. Because this might as well say assert allowed. It doesn't matter. The VM does not care what the text name of the method is. It only cares that has the exact same kind of contract as call. Call has no arguments and returns void. And assert allowed has no arguments, returns void, and throws the same exceptions. So as far as the VM's concerned, they're the same. And you can cast assert allowed to callable. And that's how method references work. So we're doing all that magic. We run it. And it works. We'll do the lambda one. Here we go. There it works in the context of the manager. But if we were to comment this out, 
and not run it as manager, we can run the code again, and it will fail, saying that we're not allowed to do it. We got a unauthorized access by principle, which is what you should get when you try to invoke something and it's not allowed. Who uses bean validation? Okay, we got, all right. Well, there you guys are really slow with the hands. <laughs> yeah, they came up literally like one after the one, two, three, four. Should, if I wait another half an hour, I think all the hands are going to go up. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let me see. Uh, here is what bean validation looks like for those of you who do not use it. Bean validation is effectively the concept of making an annotation uh, that allows you, like say, say not null, that allows, and you put that on a field or a parameter, and then magic is ensued, right? And the container says, I'm going to check to see if this object is not null. And if it is null, it throws a constraint validation exception. It says, uh -uh, not going to happen. So you can put these ba bean validations on objects. Here's what that might look like. I'm clever. I like to use inner classes to make my tests very small. So I have this object here. I've made my own validation called executable. I have. Uh, I create one file that is executable, and I create another file that is not executable. By the way, you should all, if you, <laughs> you know, you should always test the true and false version of things. Uh, I, I've, I can't, I can't describe how many times I've seen people with uh, tests that assert their equals implementation of their class, and it only tests the true. It's like, you should test false as well, because someone could just gut that whole thing that says return true, and it would still pass the test. So not a very good test. Anyway, so I test both the true and the false version of the, con the, the constraint. Um, executable basically says its implementation class the code that will actually be used to assert whether something is executable or not is defined by this annotation. This is how bean validation works. It's, a li it's a like unrolling, right? So the container, when it's asked to validate an instance of a, of, a, of a class, it looks on the fields of that class and finds every field, sees if it has a, an annotation on it, checks to see if that annotation implements constraint, and if it does, then it grabs this, grabs whatever class it says will be the actual logic that is used. And this logic effectively just says, I work, it says, it uses generics. It says, I will accept a file, and I will tell you whether or not that file is a directory or executable. So that's a lot of plumbing for that. I mean, you know, it's good because I don't want people have to do it all the time. It's nice if I can maybe wrap a few things together and make that, you know, is a readable, writable directory. You can do that kind of stuff. But it's a lot of plumbing for a Boolean result. So again, this is one of those things where I go, hmm, I see a method reference. That could be a method reference in my book. That that would be really, really awesome. But we'll go ahead and we have only one, two, three, four, five bean validation annotations. And there are effectively only five important lines of code associated with each of these annotations. Is writable or can read, you know, exists, can execute, is directory. And they're all implemented on file. But I have to implement a constraint class for each and every single one of them. And I find this work tedious. 
at the, to say the least. So that's how bean validation works. Now I'll just run the test just so we can see it. Okay. Here's an interim step. In Java 8, we added the ability for there to be uh, default methods and interfaces. So the actual interface for constraint validator, and I'll just looks like this. This is where file gets passed in or whatever object that you're, whatever type that you're validating. And then this is a context object, which is really not used very often in practice. The unfortunate truth is that this thing could never be a functional interface because it has two methods, not one. And also because it accepts this extra parameter and, and it ruins, uh, you know, there, there aren't going to be any methods that previously exist that, that take constraint validation context. So therefore, all the methods that might be really cool for you to use just don't really apply. So what we're going to do, theoretically, in EE8, this is an opportunity, uh, is one, we're going to make the initialize optional. You can implement it if you want to, but it's default now. So that's how you make an implement. So basically, we've actually implemented this interface. We've actually implemented initialize in the interface with default methods. This is something that you can do now. And if you look at the streams API and just basically lots of the new APIs in Java 8, you're going to see an interface and tons of implementation code. It's basically the new cool way to do an abstract class. It's basically the long and short of it. So even though this is interface, it's effectively now an abstract class. And the abstract implementation of initialize is to do nothing. And we're making a new method signature is valid that just takes the one type of thing we're, we're validating. And we make this older signature effectively a default implementation as well. And all it does is call is valid without the context. And now, Effectively, in terms of functional interfaces, this is now a functional interface. It has one method that's important that takes a file or whatever, the generic, and it returns a Boolean. There are a lot of existing methods that take one of itself and return a Boolean. So if we do this, we can now do some crazy magic. Where's our? Now our constraint validator implementation has just the one method. And it is now much closer to being a method reference. We still haven't solved the way to pass it, because we have to declare the implementation via an annotation, which kind of ruins our, our desire to make this uh, be a programmatic thing rather than a de declarative thing. So this is step one, is to basically to do that change in the interface. Step two would be to actually change the bean validation API in another way so that let's just say that we could grab the constraint validator factory. We have this new method register, which does not exist on this interface, by the way. This is a new method that we made up on constraint validator factory. All the job is of constraint validator factory is to instantiate these constraints that are annotated on top of uh, the annotations. It's the thing that would, that would annotate um, executable context and directory context, uh, or directory constraint. It would, this, this class would get instantiated by constraint validator factory. So what we're doing is what we just what this method is, is attempting to do, this new made up method is saying, whenever you see this annotation, 
go ahead and use this constraint validator instance. But as, we, as if you recall, we've now changed constraint validator instance, the constraint validator interface, so it's functional. So that means this, in, this thing could be a function. Not a, not a whole class that implements the interface, but a function. So now we grab the annotations, and instead of having to implement any code ourselves, we're passing in direct references to the methods from the file class, is directory, can execute, exists, can read, can write. And now we've finally taken and deleted all those constraint implementation classes, and boiled it down to five lines of code. And remaining, we have just the simple annotations directly executable, exists, readable, writable. Now, because I don't like to demo th theory code, I actually hacked this into uh, Apache BVAL, which is implementation of bean validation that we use uh, in open web beans. Now, they'll probably reject my pull request until we get something like this in, in, the, uh, in the spec, but this actually works. So that went ahead and passed. So before, that much code. After, that much code. It's a very significant difference. And this one is all dynamically done at runtime, so we theoretically could actually change the logic behind these annotations on some boot parameter. So the parameter could be, is valid tax code? And you might actually search some database to see if that is a valid tax code. You could do some pretty cool stuff with programmatic APIs. When it's declarative, you have to decide what the valid tax code is before. If it's programmatic, you can make that choice dynamically at runtime. And I think that's the fundamental shift. I've got more examples, but I think this is a pleasant place to stop because we, we don't want to go till people's brains are bleeding out their ears, but uh, I, I would have to just describe it like this. I, I see errors when I see our, our APIs in, in EE. Uh, I see the, you know, the world where XML drove everything. You know, there was um, CMP, Container Managed Persistence, and all the queries were in XML. And, you know, you had to have your home and all these interfaces, and they're all tied together with just heaps and mounds and, you know, hundreds and thousands of lines of XML. And if you changed the class name, the tools weren't so good. So all your code broke. Have fun with that, you know. And then annotations came along. And does, by the way, does anybody know how annotations got added into Java? Does anybody know the story? Yeah, well, you've heard me speak, so it's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, a there is a library called xdoclet, and it would basically try and solve the hell that was deployment descriptors in EE by doing a convention. And the convention was it was going to look at the Javadoc on the class and on the source code. And the Javadoc is at this, blah, and at author, and at version, and they added Javadoc tags. And then they would read those tags and generate XML based upon what you said in the tag. So, so basically, you were writing, people would put all this Javadoc, suddenly we became really good documenters. So we're putting all this Javadoc on all the stuff saying, this is a home interface, this is a remote interface, the query for this method is this. And then there's no XML in the, in the, in the, in the source code and the XML gets generated by the xdoclet tool. And that's how people were surviving the hell that was basically the XML-laden EJB2 and 1 era. So at, at Sun, they were like, you know, what can we do to make things better? And they basically got all together in a room. They said, no ideas are bad ideas. And someone sort of kind of raised their hand and said, well, there's this cool thing, xdoclet. What if we did that? So, well... The idea really caught fire, and they said, great, we're adding annotations. 
that didn't really have a name for them yet, writing that thing to Java, right? And so they, that's why annotations look like Javadoc, because they came from EJB's shortcoming and this little library in open source that made it easy. They actually inspired annotations in Java. So we wouldn't have annotations in Java if it wasn't for EJB. So I always like to mention that to people who who go, oh, he, he sucks, I hate it. And they're like, do you use, any, do you use annotations at all? Do you like them? Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to make mistakes in order to learn some things, right? It's, you know, the braver thing is to, to make the mistake and learn the lesson, and the not brave thing is to, to not do anything, right? So all of, our all of our APIs changed when annotations were added. So actually, EJB 3.0 was the first uh, API really to have annotations in it, and there wasn't too much that went on in that spec round. Uh, there was JAXWS that had made usage of annotations, uh, but it wasn't until the next major version of EE, w which was EE6. You know, so EE5 had some annotation stuff in it, but EE6, everything's annotated. You know, JAXRS, CDI, I mean, the whole thing, everything's annotated. JSF gets annotations, everything's, anno everything's an annotation. And now we're in this sort of world where we're very declarative. We're making all these choices at compile time. And we're programming our logic effectively via annotations at compile time. Now, with method references and lambdas, it's so tempting to just want to pass those things around. Imagine it like this. And a method is not mobile, and it's static, and can't be moved, and can't be communicated. So instead, we put the logic on it with an annotation. But now, methods can be communicated. Say, hey, here's the thing that I want to be the target of the action when the action occurs. So now, the behavior is mobile. So we're now, we're, now we're passing methods, or can, or could, pass methods and say, hey, here's the thing I want you to invoke when this, uh, when this thing occurs. So instead of the method being static and not mobile and having to make basically the annotation go to it, we could do it the reverse, as we've been seeing dynamically, programmatically at runtime by passing the logic around. And so I really think that lambdas and method references have the opportunity to fundamentally change how we're doing APIs, period, and I think the opportunity is that we can go from a very declarative-based way of thinking to a programmatic way of thinking, which will allow us to have far more dynamic applications and not so many more lines of code. Currently, you can be programmatic in the EE. We try to make a programmatic API for everything that you can do via annotations, but it's a lot more work because we can't really pass the logic around, so we have to do these funky things like, like you saw, pass a string that's serializable, pull the string out, find the thing, invoke it. So we have to do these kinds of dances, and it's not very comfortable. So we don't really find a lot of programmatic usage of EE in the real world. We find a lot of annotation usage of EE in the real world. So if we were actually to consume these Java 8 functionalities in the APIs themselves, we could change them dramatically. You saw case after case where we had this much code and it just, boom, went to half when we're taking advantages of method references and lambdas. So I think the opportunity is that we can redefine EE at a very fundamental level, simplify the APIs to a large degree. And it's very cool because guess what? We have open JCP now. You know, it used to be an invite-only thing, like this thing where you had to be, you know, just tapped on the shoulder from above, like a hand would come out from the clouds and say, you're graduated to the higher level. You know, it was a smoke-filled room type of thing. But now, there all the lists are open, and you can just show up and say, I got a cool idea. What if we did this in the API? And, uh, you know, there's a reason that we didn't see a lot of annotation stuff in 2006 because there was like a limited number of people who could do the explorations and could come up with the cool ideas. So basically, it wasn't until 2009 when the whole world had already dealt with annotations for several years that the, that the good ideas came into the specs. But now, 
they're all open, and we've all been playing with Java 8 since basically last March, or maybe you know longer. And all the specs are open, and we're not going to see EE8 land until 2017. So basically, we have all the opportunity to have huge impact on the APIs by bringing our ideas and just going, hey, you know, this little API is kind of cool, but what if we just changed it a little bit? How could I, how could I move this method that returns a Boolean over to this other spot where it really should go? So I really encourage everybody to actually look at the APIs from a perspective of, I can break this thing and make it better. And I, should, I can change it. Because that's actually the opportunity that's in front of us. And don't wait. Don't be a backseat you know, driver. You know, be, be a backseat driver. Don't be a backseat passenger that doesn't do anything. You know, like, don't just go where the car goes. You know, if you've got something you want, and you have something that you want to be easier that you're doing all the time, Try and find any idea at all to make it better and just propose it to the, to the expert group that, that might be the one that would own that idea. You're going to find that it's very well received, especially in there, there are some specs that are very, very, very open, like the CDI specification is perhaps one of the most active open expert groups that there are. As you may have heard, I'm in a lot of expert groups. But I actually didn't even join the CDI expert group until recently because I didn't really felt, feel that I needed to. Like when I wanted to get an idea communicated or participate, I just participated. I never really felt like I was not on the expert group, even though I wasn't technically on. So the doors are open. The opportunity is there. Take advantage. Don't be complaining about what you don't like about EE in 10 years when you had the opportunity to change it. It's sort of like complaining about who's president when you don't vote. So don't be that person, right? Complain about the thing that you made. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm certainly willing. I, I have one thing, too. We have, oh, yes. So. Uh, the people who are on the internet, sorry, we cannot hand you a t-shirt directly, but if you tweet, if you, tweet you, you might just earn one. Uh, but we also have this IntelliJ license to give away, so uh, I have no idea how to... Someone pick a number between 1 and 10. That's not between 1 and 10. <laughs> Modulus that by 10, that comes out to be 5. Who wants and uh, who does not have an IntelliJ license? Uh, you were the first one to raise your hands. So there you go. Okay. Thank you much, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the.